Welcome to the culture. We rest at the pulse of the community, providing all things news, music, fashion events, and everything that we talk about in between. It's a lifestyle. We are the culture. Hi, and welcome to the the culture. I'm your host, Jessica Garrett Motkins, and it's Women's History Month. And all month, we've brought you topics geared to help you. We've honored our our Black Women this month, and we are so excited about that. And joining us today, we have back on the culture, Dr. Yolanda Holmes. She's a board certified dermatologist and surgeon, both in medical and cosmetic surgery. She's been featured in many publications, including Essence Magazine. She's also a faculty member at the HU, Howard University. Welcome, Dr. Holmes, to the culture. Hi, happy Sunday, everyone. Yes, happy (laughs) Sunday. Now, when you were here last time, we had an opportunity to talk about Black women and our skin. And today is all about our hair. What are you seeing in your practice primarily with Black women in our hair? Well, I see a lot of patients that have a condition called seborrheic dermatitis, which is basically like dandruff of the scalp. It can be very thick, scaly. Sometimes people have scales that drop on their clothing, but it's very easily treated. It is something that we treat. We don't say it's curable because it can recur, but we have medications to control it. I also am beginning to, well, not beginning because I've seen it for a while, but I see a lot of scarring alopecia in women of color. And that is one thing that we recently have found out that there is a gene associated, but we think some of our hair care practices also contribute to it as well. I do see alopecia areata, which are round spots of hair loss. I also see telogen in the fluvium, which happens after you have a baby or after you have a major illness or after you lose a lot of weight or any change in your body metabolism. So I see quite a bit of hair loss in my practice. Now, I didn't even understand that there were degrees of hair loss, scarring, non-scarring, as well as permanent hair loss. Can you explain the difference between those? Well, scarring alopecia really results from chronic inflammation of the scalp. And one of the issues in people of color is sometimes inflammation is not so visible. When you think of something inflamed, you think of it red and irritated. But what we found in the scarring alopecia, many times the scalp looks normal. So a lot of times the scalp biopsy is necessary to diagnose. Many times people will have tenderness or pain or severe itching in the area. That could also be a sign of inflammation. In terms of permanent hair loss, fortunately, we don't see it so much. People believe that scarring alopecia would be permanent. However, we do see people that get some regrowth. And that's why we encourage you, if you have any scalp issues going on, especially burning, itching, hair loss, any type of hair loss, you should see your dermatologist as soon as possible. And now you mentioned earlier about pregnancy and hair loss. And I know that that was something that I personally experienced in both of my pregnancies. One, it was worse than the other. But what is the nature behind that? What happens? There's a change in your hormones. So once you had deliver a baby, your hormones change. And because of that, you uh, experience a transient shedding of hair. Most times in six months or so, your hair is back to normal or beginning to come back to normal, but it's the sudden change in hormones that happen after you deliver a baby. It's very, very common. So when we actually see this balding loss of hair uh, in our um, on our scalp, that is what alopecia is? Yeah, alopecia is just a general term that means hair loss. That really doesn't give us any information. The issue is we need to know what type of hair loss it is. So many times we'll recommend the biopsy of the scalp. Conditions like alopecia areata, which are round spots of hair loss, and they're usually very round and circular, those are very uh, easy to identify without the biopsy. But other types of alopecia, 
you really need to do a biopsy to see what type it is. There's another type that is usually genetic called androgenetic alopecia, which we see in women, but we also see it in men. In men, it's more well known as male pattern baldness, but there is also a female pattern baldness that occurs. And it is genetic many times or most times. Speak to uh, traction alopecia. Traction alopecia is seen a lot in women of color because of how we style our hair. Many times if you've seen, and I've had the experience that you could see little girls with their hair so neatly braided or, or put in ponytails, but it's so, so tight. Pulling the edges of your hair very tight and slicking them down can cause traction. And if that is repeated, it could, it could result in what we believe could be a permanent hair loss. And we have some uh, images to see also, Dr. Holmes. What, is, what are we seeing here? This looks like it is possibly a traction alopecia. Um, as you can see, her edges are very, very thin. You know, I, I think the most definitive way to um, um, diagnose it would be to do a biopsy, but based on the location, I would say it's probably traction. Now, the other thing it could be, it could be an androgenetic alopecia. Typically, um, the androgenetic alopecia is more at the temporal areas, but it could be a combination of traction and androgenetic alopecia. Mm -hmm. And what about this one? And I know we're just looking at pictures here. You're not able to truly diagnose because they're not in your practice. Okay, so this looks like a picture of what we call ophiasis. It's a type of alopecia areata, but it's along the edges of the hairline. This one can sometimes be a little more difficult to treat. However, it's not, you know, not to say that it couldn't be treated, but it takes a little longer to treat this. But ophiasis is a type of alopecia areata that occurs along the hairline. It may occur along the frontal hairline. It may be occur along the sides or the back, but it is a form of alopecia areata. And what about this one? It kind of looks similar to the first one that we looked this looks like it could be traction. This could also be someone who had a telogen effluvium, who may have had a baby, who may have had an anemia, who may have had a increase in weight loss, who may have been sick. So mm -hmm. this could be, it could be a traction, but it could be telogen effluvium. And that's why a biopsy would be necessary. And then this, this last slide, um, I noticed this quite a bit. Uh, along the nape area. Yeah, this condition tends to be co more common in men of color. It's called acne keloidalis, where they get like little um, papules or keloids along the hairline. It's very common in men of color who get their hair cut with razors. You know, they have the razors that they shave the hair there. And we're really not sure. We think it's an inflammatory reaction. Many times people think that it could be an infection, but it's not an infection. It's an inflammatory reaction. But all of these conditions can be treated. How can we reduce our chances of developing uh, some of the types of hair losses? Well, the, there's some that are genetic. Androgenetic alopecia is a genetic thing. So unfortunately, it's, be, it's um, beyond your control. The thing is, when you notice things that are happening, you should seek treatment early because they can be, they can be controlled and treated. Um, things like traction can be avoided. Not really tight braids and tight uh, uh, weaves. Those things contribute to traction alopecia. We also believe that those tight styles also contribute to a scarring alopecia as well. Now, there was a time when we thought that maybe chemicals, which chemicals probably did contribute, has contributed to scarring alopecia now. But right now, because of a lot of people wearing more natural hair, we're seeing it a lot in folks with ha natural hair as well. Yes. And, and speaking of natural hair, I know that because we've been in COVID for um, dealing with stay in home, stay home, stay at home orders for quite a bit and going in and out. And our, our normals are different now. We as black women have not been able to go to the hairdresser to get our hair done every other week like we normally have been doing it 
prior to COVID uh, and more natural hairstyles have come up. I thought that that may have contributed to uh, what we saw that viral video with the young lady in her hair, putting the um, spray glue in her hair. I was so surprised that she was able to recover with, and it looked, I don't know, but it looked like she didn't have any, any sort of skin um, problem after on her scalp. Yeah, she was very, very fortunate because I've seen people who've had um, like weaves glued to their hair and all of their hair came out. Fortunately enough that the person, the, the patient that I remember, her hair is growing back. But you have to be really careful with a lot of those chemicals and things. With um, hair weaves, I prefer the um, sew-in types where they can sew it into the braids or whatever because we do see a lot of reactions to the glue. And sometimes it could be permanently damaging to your scalp depending on the type of reaction that you have. Wow, I didn't think of that. It, the glue also can contribute to uh, a form of alopecia on the scalp. Yes, yes, because you it can cause, you know, if you have a reaction, it can cause a severe inflammation and you can lose like with my patient, she lost pretty much all of her hair. She was devastated. But the thing about that people should keep in mind, if something is put on your skin or scalp and it starts to burn or sting immediately, it needs to be rinsed or washed out or taken out as soon as possible. Now, you mentioned with one of those uh, graphics that we put up. Um, that a possible reason for her hair loss could have been weight loss. Yeah. Well, that's a telogen effluvium. So telogen effluvium is a type of hair loss that occurs when any of your body metabolism changes. So if you become anemic, if you have a major surgery, any of those things where your body metabolism is changed, you could lose hair. So that, but what is fortunate about that, it is usually reversible. It usually will, within about six months or so, you'll begin to recover from it. Got it. Are there vitamins that uh, we should lean towards to help with hair loss? Well, there are some, and one of the ones that I take and that I promote at my practice is something called Nutrafol. Nutrafol is a, a relatively, was well, kind of new to my practice, but um, it has been around, I think, for maybe a year or two. But one of the things that caused me to embrace it, that it was embraced by many dermatologists. A lot of the dermatologists that specialized in hair didn't really think that the vitamins were that helpful. However, because of the research with Nutrafol, they tended to embrace it. And it tends to really, really work well. We actually do sell it in our practice. We're going to be able to, able to sell it on our website. If you tend to buy it from a physician's office, you get it a little cheaper. You have to buy it in a three-month supply, but you end up saving money in the long run because if you, I think you save at least about twelve or fifteen dollars if you buy it, you know, as opposed to you buying it monthly on the website. But it's definitely one of the things that I took it myself and I saw the difference in my hair when I started to take it. Oh, nice. Nice. Now, that's um, a vitamin. What about some medicines that you have been prescribing to in, uh, some of your black patients that you found to be effective? OK, one of the things we do is we give antibiotics, but we give the antibiotic mainly for the anti-inflammatory effect of it. So a lot of times when you use low dose antibiotics, it's not antimicrobial or it's not against bacteria, it's against the, the inflammation. So that's one thing we do. We also do topical um, anti-inflammatories like oils or um, solutions or creams or ointments that will help. Um, sometimes we also, I'm trying to think what other things, we give minoxidil. Minoxidil is Rogaine. Rogaine is something that is used to treat androgenetic alopecia, female pattern baldness, male pattern baldness, and that comes in both an oral or a topical form. You mentioned topical. Um, is there anything to all of these magic hair serums that we're seeing on the internet that are like oils that you're supposed to put on your hair and it magically makes your hair grow? Well, you know, there's the thing about it, what's unfortunate in a lot of the holistic products, there's no regulation. So they really don't have to prove that they actually work. 
But, you know, historically, if you review the literature, there are some things that actually do work and they won't hurt you, the majority of them. So I always say, if you want to try it, you should try it. Um, You know, there's no guarantee that it's going to work for you, but I think the oils are not going to hurt you unless you have an allergic reaction. And one thing people don't always keep in mind, just because a product is natural does not mean that you will not have a reaction to it. I've seen it several times before. And what are your thoughts on hair transplant surgery? I think hair transplant surgery is good if you go to a reputable place. It is very expensive, so you might want to explore some other options first. We do a process called PRP, where inject, we inject your serum back into your scalp, and that tends to stimulate hair growth. But I do think if you want to go that route, hair transplants are very effective. Tell us a little bit more about that practice, that um, procedure that you mentioned. PRP, PRP is where we take your blood, we spin it down, we separate your plasma from your blood because your plasma has many growth factors that will affect hair. And they're actually doing, they're actually taking the process a bit above. I haven't done it yet, but they're using stem cells to inject back into the scalp too that is supposed to stimulate hair growth. I've been doing PRP at my office and, you know, some people are doing very well. Unfortunately, you can't guarantee folks, but for some folks, it does work very well. How much was a procedure like that start at roughly? Usually because you need a series of three treatments, it usually starts, I say, anywhere from about mm, 2,100 or so. It's like about anywhere from 700 to 850 per treatment. Mm -hmm. And And they recommend you do three. Okay. And so that's how you come up with a rough 2100 because yes. it's divided mm-hmm. by three. Uh, and then as it relates to as we age, Black women, I've noticed even just in my, myself as well as other um, older Black women in my circle, their hair begins to thin. Is that true? That is true. Your hair begins to thin as you age because you're not getting the benefits of those hormones. One of the things that has helped me is taking the Nutrafol, you know, because I felt like I was at a point where my hair wasn't growing anymore and it didn't have the fullness and body like it used to. But that taking the vitamin has really, really helped. Mm, I was wondering if it was just me because I'm going, my hair seems to be a lot thinner than it was just three years ago. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, okay, so that's true. And then uh, before we leave, let's talk about conditioners and shampoos because we tend to believe that all conditioners and shampoos are relatively the same. Um, what would you advise to Black women for a regular hair routine with shampoo and conditioner? Well, I think, you know, there's so many products on the market and some of them are very good. And I think really a good indicator is how it makes your hair feel and how your hair comes out after you do it with the products. But one of the things that tend to be a little more drying to our hair is sodium lauryl sulfate. So we try to have you steer free from products that contain that. You know, there are a lot of natural ingredients. I think petrolatum that they're saying that you should not use. But I think the final decision should be how does your hair feel? And you know the difference of when you use a shampoo or conditioner that's good for your hair. You can see the difference in the way your hair feels and how it performs. I do think that you should use a, a conditioner every time you wash your hair, especially in black hair, because our hair tends to be drier. Um, you know, if people ask in terms of what I think in terms of um, shampooing, I am one who recommends shampooing once a week, where some people say every two weeks. And I mean, it, it depends on your hair because I, I know it can be a lot of work. But I do think that you should maybe invest in some products that you feel, well, you know, that feel good on your hair and make your hair um, look good after you style it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Holmes, for joining us. You are always a breath of fresh air, full of knowledge and giving us information that we definitely need to be cognizant of in our lives. We appreciate you. I forgot to tell you all last time that I do virtual appointments. If anybody yeah. interested, you know, my website is YolandaHolmesMD.com. That'll give you all my information. But I do do virtual appointments. Yes, she does. And she is my shameless plug. She's my dermatologist and she's located in the greater 
D M C. D D M. I don't know where it is. Oh, DC. I was mixing DC with DMV. Yeah. Right. DMV. That's right. District uh, Maryland and Virginia. Maryland, Virginia. Uh, yes. Year. Yes. Well, thank you so much. And, and to all of you, you can join us tonight on My Two Cents at 6 p.m. We are on the culture and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been thank good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. The Culture is produced and owned by Hip Rock Star Media and cannot be reproduced or broadcast without written consent by Jessica Garrett Mockins. All rights reserved 2020.